Um, good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So welcome, welcome to this uh, event uh, on policy gap analysis for the energy transition um, by, Tufts, by the Climate Policy Lab of uh, Tufts University. Uh, we have with us three great presenters. Uh, we have my uh, Deborah, we have Emily, and we have Abai, a great team of people. Uh, you know, we begin talking about the energy transition, we talk about policies and so on. But the whole reason why you have the Climate Policy Lab at Tufts University is that very often we don't look at the importance of policy in making the transition happen. And it's one thing to say you've done policy, but it's another thing to see if the policy speaks to another policy that speaks to the other policy that all together work towards the just transition. And as you will see in some of the presentations and the discussions today, that is not always the case. But with the right policy and with the right tools, like the modeling tools, we're going to start with the future energy modeling uh, tool. With the right policy, we can actually achieve the energy transition. So bringing the policy gap analysis with the modeling tools to inform the investment is really the winning formula. And, and that is what the Climate Policy Lab at Tufts University is really all about. You know, how do we uh, do the policy gap analysis, understand what needs to be done, then bring the modeling to then inform the investment. And of course, by informing the investments, we'll also see what the energy transition, what possible, what is the possible landscape for the energy transition. So let me start by uh, asking Deborah to uh, do your presentation, please. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Deborah Sunter. I'm an assistant professor at Tufts University, and I have appointments in civil and environmental engineering, computer science, and mechanical engineering. And so today, I'm excited to tell you a little bit about a powerful analytical tool that's free, open source, it's called Switch, and it can be used for modeling um, energy transitions and implement and understanding different policy analysis that can be done. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. Sorry about this. Apologies for uh, Thank you for your patience.
So please uh, just bear with us as we sort out the technical issue with the presentation. All right, success, we finally have it so that the slides can work. So I'm, I apologize for that and I really appreciate all your patience. So for those of you who jo just joined, I wanna reintroduce myself. I'm Deborah Sunter. I am an assistant professor at Tufts University where I have appointments in civil and environmental engineering, computer science, and mechanical engineering. And today I'm excited to talk to you about the switch model. It's a free open access tool that can be used for long-term energy planning. We're gonna, it'll become more smooth in the transitions as we go on. It'll, it'll get better, I promise. All right, so when you're doing long-term energy planning, there's a lot of different stakeholders and there's several different things you want to optimize. So you want to reduce the cost of electricity and you want to increase accessibility. So there are some communities that don't yet have access to electricity and there are ones that do have access but they're being underserved by electricity. And we also want to make sure that when we're making these energy plans, we're doing so taking into account 
new emerging renewable energy technologies so that we can make sure that our grid is as clean as possible and meet environmental standards. And so the switch model can help uh, facilitate conversation and improve planning with those stakeholders. There are three main focus areas for the switch model. The first way that the switch model is most often used is for long-term energy planning. So the way the switch model works is that you have all the electrical grid infrastructure currently, and then you're going to consider how are things going to change in the future? How are you going to meet increasing demand? Um, how are you going to uh, accommodate emerging policies and new technologies? And so you can see how the grid infrastructure will change over time. The next way that switch is often used is to do project assessment. So perhaps you're interested in comparing some different potential power plants that you're considering installing. Maybe you want to decide where the most effective place is to place that solar farm or wind farm. Or maybe you want to decide between different clean technologies which one would be most effective for your grid. And now the third way that the switch model is often used is for policy impact analysis. And I think this is really appropriate for this COP community because switch has a lot of opportunity to not just minimize the cost, but it can do so under different policy constraints. So you could consider integrating into the switch model carbon taxes, carbon caps, renewable portfolio goals. And under these different policies, you can see how that will impact the long-term energy planning of your grid. So what will the price of electricity be under those different policy constraints? And also, what will be the emissions produced by that grid? So now I want to dive a little bit deeper into how the model works. So the switch model, it's a linear deterministic electricity capacity expansion model. And so when I'm talking about electricity expansion, there's a lot of different ways that you can think about how the grid is changing with time. So there are communities that are underserved with electricity, and so bringing access to those communities is going to increase your energy demand. You, there's also a huge movement towards electrifying other sectors, such as transportation, cooking, and heating. And as those sectors get electrified, there'll be more demand required of your electrical grid. However, it's important to recognize that not all grids are increasing in demand. Some, because of effective energy efficiency policies, might be reducing demand. However, with every single uh, grid infrastructure that exists, every power plant is only going to last so long. It has a lifetime, and at the end of its lifetime, the switch model is going to make a choice. Is it going to invest money to um, upgrade that power plant that's reached its end of life? Or is it going to decide to retire that power plant and instead build out new capacity? And then the question is, where will that capacity be put? And what type of technology should, should be used? Now the switch model, it's a, it's a, one of the great benefits of the switch model is it co-optimizes investment and dispatch. And this is particularly important because a lot of the emerging technologies that we're putting on the grid are solar and wind, and these have strong temporal patterns. So not at all times will the sun be shining and the wind blowing, and you want to make sure that when you're creating your grid that you're able to account for that temporal variability, as well as the temporal variability in when people want to use the energy and when the demand is. So this is a time-synchronized model. And so typically the way that the model works is every month we, have, we take a subset of select days. So we normally have an average day and a peak demand day. And then we model that day using historical patterns and future projections over a study period. And our study period could last anywhere between Hello? 20 to 50 years. And seeing how- I cannot how hear anything, sorry. Um, and just see how the power grid will change with time. It's not audible. I cannot get any sound. Oh, is that, okay, that's not us? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so after we do this uh, analysis, then we can go back and do some post-processing and make sure that at all times, at all hours, in all investment periods, we're able to meet or exceed uh, demand with the generation that's planned on the grid. I also want to emphasize that the switch model is incredibly flexible, both in spatial and temporal resolution. So although I typically use this, the switch model with hourly resolution, some researchers have uh, 
decided to look at much higher resolution, such as five minutes or 15 minutes, and others have decided to look at uh, longer time durations. Um, similarly with spatial re resolution, this analysis has been done at regional, state, country, and multi-country level analyses. So the objective of the switch model is to minimize costs. So it's trying to minimize the net present value of all of the costs associated with the electrical grid. So that includes capital costs of new investment in power plants, storage projects, transmission and distribution lines, as well as the costs associated with fixed operation and maintenance of all that infrastructure, as well as variable costs that are incurred by each plant. And so those could be variable operation and maintenance costs, as well as fuel costs. And this is an opportunity that you can integrate a carbon tax um, and that could also become a variable cost associated with specific power plants. All right, so after the switch model is created, what can you do with the results? So once again, returning to those three main focus areas, let's start with the first focus area, which was long-term energy planning. So the nice thing about the long-term energy planning is, with the, as a switch output is you'll get things such as the output of the electricity price over the time horizon. So you could see how your different investment decisions or policies are going to affect the long-term price of your electricity. You're also, since you're going to be seeing your energy grid evolve, the portfolio grow, evolve, you're going to understand what electricity generation mix is going to be most prevalent, and you can plan for investment strategies to support those emerging technologies Hello? in How the area. It also allows for regional grid planning. So uh, one of the outputs of switch is understanding where transmission needs to be built. And oftentimes this is transmission across regions or even crossing country borders. And so understanding these long-term transmission plans are really important for regional planning. The next way that the switch model could be used is the focus area is with project assessment. And so project assessment, you can compare uh, which projects are adopted under different scenarios? So is there certain power plants that Hello? are adopted Hello? more often than others? I'm unmuted. You can, can, can you hear me? And so, <laughs> I cannot hear you. I, I'm sorry, there's this other but conversation happening. <laughs> um, but I'm just going to try to speak over I'm them and keep going. I'm not getting any sound from you. Um, yeah, and so one of the scenarios that we're going to be studying in a case example shortly is under drought conditions and not, and how the investment portfolio changes under different scenarios, and that can help you understand which projects are more robust to different uh, scenarios. And this can help ultimately uh, help the user decide where's the most robust site selection for power plants. All right, so now the, the last way that the switch model is used is for policy impact analysis. And so the outputs from the switch model is often the greenhouse gas emissions that people are most interested in. But I want to emphasize that that's only one potential output. And, there, and the switch model is very adaptable and diverse. And so you could explore other environmental impacts, such as other air pollutants, water use, or land use. And, another, and that can help you understand both how you're going to meet global climate goals, um, as well as what communities might be most affected by certain energy pathways. And this leads to the last output that I want to discuss is access and equity. So using the switch model, you can see which communities are going to gain access and at what point uh, to like, gain access to electricity. And you'll also see like which power plants are going to be shut down. And as you shut down dirty power plants, you're going to be improving equity and justice by reducing the health impacts of the communities that were in, affected by those dirty power plants. And an example that I'll be giving shortly is how uh, green jobs has also been integrated into the switch model as a potential output to explore equity and justice. So uh, hopefully at this point you've learned a little bit about how the switch model works and hopefully you're excited and you too want to be part of the switch community. And I welcome you to that. The switch model has been used by about um, a dozen different countries from around the world, and although this graph is a little bit late, there's a growing community of Switch users. As I mentioned before, the Switch model, it's free, it's open source, it's written in Python. You can go to this website and it gives you the documentation and you can download it. And I hope that this is something that you're interested in. One of the things I'm hoping to do is have Switch training, and so it'll be an opportunity for you to come up and let me know that you're interested, and I'd love to help support you as you learn how to use this tool.
So after you've decided that you're excited to use the model, you've downloaded it, now you're going to have to put in some model inputs. So basically with these model inputs, one is a snapshot of what your energy grid is right now. So where are your generation sites? What type of, what type of installed capacity do you have? Where is it located? Where, where's your transmission lines? And so just a snapshot of what's happening right now on your, grid, your infrastructure. You also need to know what are your current energy demands. Now, we're, we, our, the switch model ultimately is trying to project into the future. So now we want to estimate what's going to happen in the future. And perhaps you have several different scenarios, low, medium, and high. And uh, uh, you can do a variety of case studies. So when it comes to demand, maybe you're expecting that you're going to grow in manufacturing and you expect there to be a substantial amount of growth in electricity demand in certain regions. Or maybe you're trying to electrify communities that haven't yet been fully electrified and that's going to increase demand. You can know where you expect that demand to grow. You could also implement energy efficiency programs and look at projections that might level out or slow the energy demands. Now, we also want to think about how our electrical grid infrastructure is going to change over time. So you'll also want to have data inputs on where you could potentially put power plants um, and how much that power plant would cost. So a lot of that can be based on historical information. But then you can also consider um, new technologies that could emerge. And so since solar and wind are very prominent technology, it's really important to understand the temporal effect and so you can integrate historical weather data in order to understand the energy generation for those different sites. So lastly, we also would need an input of fuel costs currently and projected fuel costs. And, the la and at that point, you have enough to run a switch model. Now, one of the beautiful things about the switch model is that you can implement so many different policy analyses. And so you could consider putting in RPS goals or um, carbon tax or carbon caps and then see how the model changes the results under those different policy scenarios. And that's the last input, the input number 10. Apologies, we're having the same technical difficulty as before. So. Oh. All right, so now I would like to go over some select examples of how different countries have used the switch model. So I'm going to start off with the western portion of the United States, and this is where the switch model was first used. And here we see the electricity power grid projected both in 2030 and 2050. So the size of the pie chart shows how much energy is being generated in the different regions of the United States. And the colors within the pie chart show what energy sources that generation is coming from. And the green lines are indicative of how much transmission flows between those areas, and the thickness of the line is the capacity of that transport. So here you can notice that in the southwest, there used to be quite a bit of, or there is currently a lot of uh, natural gas, and over time, that gets replaced with solar. And then in the center of the country, you'll see that there's a big growth in wind energy. One of the areas that I'm personally working on is extending the switch model for the eastern part of the United States and focusing on the offshore energy revolution, looking at uh, offshore wind, wave, and tidal. And both of these are new emerging 
opportunities for electricity capacity gr growth, and I'm curious how that will affect the long-term energy planning of the country. Another early adopter of the switch model is China, and so ch here you can see um, what the emissions are in billions of metric tons of CO2, both currently in the dark uh, black line, and then projected based on the switch model in different scenarios. So the the dotted purple line is the business as usual, and then you can see different case studies for um, running the switch model with low cost renewable energy um, and a carbon cap, and then also running it to meet the IPCC targets. And now you can see those results looking at each of these panels shows one of those scenarios and what the installed capacity is. And so you'll notice in the far left, you have the business as usual, which is predominantly coal, which is in that dark gray. And but however, in the other scenarios, you can see how the share of Down coal the decreases and is replaced sense. by other technologies. And since one of the big benefits of switch is the co-optimization of generation and dispatch, um, I want to also d demonstrate how switch uses dispatch. So each of these panels is the 12 months in a year. The, the mm, hours of the day for understand. a typical day is along the X axis, and the energy generation is along the Y. And so the dark black line is the energy demand. And so let's look at just our first year, in or first month, January. So you'll notice in the afternoon, the solar, which is shown in the yellow, exceeds demand. And so that excess energy that's generated can be put into storage, and that's in the gray uh, that is appears as like below zero in generation. And so then later in the afternoon, when the solar wanes, then we're able to discharge from our, our battery storage to, to put that onto the grid later. And so hopefully this kind of demonstrates how the switch model can take into account uh, dispatch and storage at the same time. And since we're in the See, African yeah, Pavilion, I want to also mention some of the work that's already been done in Africa. So there is a Switch Kenya model. On, on the left, you'll see a map of the existing electricity infrastructure. And on the right, you'll see a variety of scenarios that were explored uh, in this analysis. And I particularly like how the Switch Kenya results are presented by these researchers because in the Leftmost panel in panel A, you'll see the business as usual, what the installed capacity is over time. And then in the panel B, you'll see for all the oh, variety of scenarios hear. that were shown in the last slide, the different types of you can hear it now? Change, yeah. relative changes in the installed capacity. So if we focus on just the three rightmost in panel B, you'll notice that storage shown in orange is increasing substantially and it's essentially replacing the fossil fuels in natural gas and coal, which is shown in like negative bar chart. And the last country I wanna highlight is Switch Chile. And, and so in this model, what they did is they looked at three scenarios, business as usual, and then two different carbon caps. One with 400 million tons of CO2 and the other of 100 million tons of CO2. And the reason that I chose this is I feel like they uh, modified the switch model to answer the questions that they were most curious about, which had to do with clean jobs. And so in the three columns, you can see the three scenarios that were studied, the business as usual, and the 400 million ton carbon cap, and the 100 million ton carbon cap. And you can see in different periods, the range of expected green jobs that would be produced according to the switch model. And so although I only had time to give a few examples of countries that have used the switch model, I want to just emphasize that it's been used in many countries, and this is just a small subset of examples. And I also want to encourage you that this is an invitation of collaboration. So one of the things that motivated me to do this presentation is that I really want to grow the switch community. Um, and I think anyone who's interested, please let me know. I think this is a really powerful tool, and I think you can really enjoy using it. So I had given the, a very similar talk uh, over the summer at the Climate Policy Lab's Summer Climate Academy. And this is a, an event that happens in the summer where senior climate government leaders, representatives from nonprofits, and academic researchers come together to do knowledge exchange on current climate policy options and try to develop technical and analytical tools needed to address those policies.
I mean, when the Zoom goes up, And so right? it was when during that that Zoom, I gave this presentation. Then what am I going to do? Cut up the and Zoom. it inspired a collaboration that started with Zoom one of the participants, Andualam, and his team in Ethiopia. And I'd like to turn the podium over Zoom now to, to my, my PhD student, Emily Holt, who's going to talk about how that collaboration has been going in this very short time, because it just started in July, and I want to show you what a collaboration with the Switch community can do. So here, here's Emily. Stop him. No, 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 no. Good What's evening. Now? My name is Emily Holt, what? and I'm a computer Go science ahead. PhD ahead. student in Dr. Sunter's lab. Going, I'm not As part of my dissertation, I'm working with Dr. Sunter to help build out Switch Ethiopia no, and model renewable okay, energy investments under climate here. uncertainty. I can pull up on uh, five or ten. Ten is the PowerPoint. No, PowerPoint. Okay. If she needs a uh, PowerPoint also? Yeah, I'll look at that. Yeah, but just do it quickly. Which one? Close it, look behind us, just do it alternate. See how many screens are open. She's looking for something. Wait. You go check for which, which power? Which power? The same one. Oh. Here. We need to go like that. Yeah, it's okay. Maybe we'll still have to Yeah, because that's why Kay made the double one together, didn't he? Wonderful. The Switch Ethiopia collaboration began this past summer after Dr. Sunter's invitation for collaboration at the Summer Climate Academy. Leaders from Ethiopia Electric Power Team reached out and have been enthusiastic partners in developing Ethiopia's oh God, Switch since. So Without their data yeah. on Ethiopian power grids and their critical guidance in developing the core models, the, this collaboration and this presentation here at the COP would not be possible. Though these initial results we're sharing today are already providing valuable insights, we emphasize that these results are preliminary and require further refinement as we continue running our experiments. When setting up our experiments, we use data provided by the Ethiopia Electric Power Team on the administrative regions shown in the plot on the left. For our switch experiments, these regions are modeled as load zones with the transport capacity shown as transmission lines illustrated in the plot on the right. We first outline Ethiopia's current power grid broken down by energy sources represented in the points in the graph on the right. Currently, the majority of Ethiopia's electricity is supplied by hydroelectric power, which can be seen faintly in the points plotted on the map. These points are size proportional to the energy produced in each load zone. And the transmission lines, again, are size proportionally to the power flowing between the load zones. Now to dive into our initial experiments, which focused on the power grid expansion needed to meet Ethiopia's growing electricity needs. We use switch to model Ethiopia's load zones and changing domestic energy needs through the year 2045. Ethiopia's domestic electricity demand is projected to grow over 50% from the current demand from 14 terawatt hours in 2022 to nearly 23 terawatt hours by 2045. The power plants needed to meet these demands will be built to support a diverse mix of energy sources. While the majority of Ethiopia's current power is hydro, as can be seen in the 2022 data point in the plot on the right, the we observe no, that switch projects an increase of wind and here? solar, as awesome well as geothermal. We observe that a more diverse selection of energy sources is needed for the least cost grid over the next 20 to 30 years. That is interesting. We can observe these, observe these trends geospatially, plotted on the loan zones of Ethiopia here. By 2035, we observe that each load zone will produce more energy, noted by the increased size of every pie chart compared to those plotted on slide 30. Ah. Ah. Can you hear the room now? All right. We're powering through. So we also observe that several load zones 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> we also observed that several load zones are projected to support a variety of energy sources by 2035. Both northern and southern load zones are projected to install wind farms to meet these energy demands. While we also observed that Tigre, the northernmost load zone, mm -hmm. Harari, the small zone center west, and Aromia, the center bottom, will install increasing amounts of solar power compared to the 2022 grid. Yeah. By 2045, we see that the energy Sound production of each load right. zone so is projected to, to grow even further to reach these we energy demands. The Additionally, we observe that more Africa. wind will be installed to increase so to meet these increasing demands. Specifically, we see an increase in the shares of wind power in Amhara and Afar in the north, as well as Aromia and the southern nations, nationalities, and people's load zones in the south. We also observe that more solar will be installed, complementing that increase we see in the installation of wind power. Specifically, we observe an increase in the solar capacity in those central load zones in both Harari and Addis Ababa, as well as an increase in the share of solar energy in the north in Tigray. These geospatial trends allow us the opportunity to visualize not only how much more energy will need to come onto the grid in the next decades, but also how much of it will come from diverse energy sources and where these plants are most needed. In addition to the hydro currently fueling the majority of Ethiopia, SWITCH projects the need to diversify with increasing amounts of solar and wind to complement this production of hydro. In summary, we observe an increase in energy production needed to meet growing de domestic demands. Mm -hmm. However, Ethiopia plans to export increasing amounts of electricity to neighboring countries over the Everybody next few decades. Exporting clean energy can be a rich opportunity for the country to profit for many years. Though the additional demand on the Ethiopian grid will require increasing amounts of installed capacity to be built out rapidly to not only meet these domestic demands, but also these export goals. Specifically, Ethiopia projects that demand for exported energy will increase over 600% in the next two decades. And similarly to the plot shown for the domestic demand growth scenario on slide two, uh, 32, we continue observing increases in both wind and solar through 2045 in this export scenario. However, with these ambitious export demands, we observe that hydro, geothermal, solar, and wind are without energy storage technologies or demand response policies are not sufficient to meet projected demands. We observe that natural gas is projected to come onto the grid in order to meet these demands, especially in the morning and evening hours. This may complicate the environmental benefits of potential export scenarios if Ethiopia's grid is not cleaner than the evolving energy portfolios in neighboring countries. Alternatives to natural gas, such as energy storage technologies, should be considered in the future. Now to dive deeper into these results, we again plot these model outputs geospatially to reserve the projected 2045 grid broken down by load zone under the scenario of planned export goals. We plot the projected grid for the domestic only demand on the left for comparison. We first observe that every load zone will need to produce even more energy than previously seen under our domestic dom only scenario, which is illustrated by the fact that every pie chart is larger on the right plot compared to the left. We also notice that large amounts of renewables will make up the majority of this new capacity matching our plots from the previous slide. We observe that wind farms are projected to be built out in western loan zones of Afar, Somali, and Aromia, and a lesser but still noticeable extent in Diradawa. Additionally, we observe that large amounts of solar are projected to be built out in the central load zones of Tigre, Amhara, Addis Ababa, as well as Aromia. While most load zones will be able to meet these increasing energy demands with purely renewable sources, we observe that Tigre, the northernmost load zone, is projected to need natural gas, shown by that purple slice in the pie chart, come onto the grid by 2045 in this export-heavy scenario. We see the effects of bringing on natural gas to meet export demands and the projected CO2 emissions under this scenario. If only meeting expected domestic energy demand, we observe that there are no projected CO2 emissions by 2045. This outcome would maintain Ethiopia's current clean grid. However, with the intention of meeting these ambitious export goals, we see the need to bring on natural gas. 
would result in over 20 metric megatons of cumulative CO2 released by 2045. However, these projected emissions could be alleviated with energy storage technologies, which were not included in our initial experiments. With storage technology, solar and wind generation could be stored and dispatched later, mitigating some of the need for those current projections of natural gas. It is also important to take into consideration the carbon intensity across neighboring countries if Ethiopia must bring on natural gas. There could still be an environmental benefit if the carbon intensities of Ethiopia export energy is less than that carbon intensity of the electrical grid of the country purchasing that energy. Finally, we move on to the other scenario we explored in these initial experiments. For this scenario, we explore the potential of drought condition in combination with those previously explored export goals. In their recent publication, McConan et al. stated that by 2065, the capacity factor of hydroelectric technology was expected to drop by half. Based on, these ex on the numbers reported in this work, we ran our switch experiments with a linear decrease in hydroelectric capacity factors between 2022 and 2065, reaching half the 2022 capacity by 2065. We did this in order to observe the switch outputs under drought conditions. We observed that under these proposed drought conditions, we see a drop in hydroelectric power production of almost 20% by 2045. We also observed that even under drought conditions, CO2 emissions will remain at zero if the grid only needs to meet those domestic demands. However, we do see that increase in CO2 emissions under drought conditions in the export goals scenario, meaning that additional natural gas is projected to come onto the grid in order to meet the export demands in drought conditions. Essentially, we observe that natural gas is supplementing that loss of energy production from hydro. As mentioned before, these natural gas estimates can be mitigated with energy storage technologies. The addition of energy storage technologies will be explored in more complex experiments as we continue this work forward. Finally, we compare the resulting cost of energy. We expect the cost of energy to be higher under drought conditions, though the question is by how much. To answer this research question, we compared the percent difference in cost of electricity between no drought scenarios versus the drought scenarios. We repeated this calculation for each, uh, for each fraction of the, the export goals of Ethiopia. We observed that the cost of electricity increases over time for every scenario. Specifically, we observed that the cost of electricity grows more sharply, exceeding a 10% cost increase by 2045 under the scenario when all of Ethiopia's export goals are met. This is compared to approximately the 5% increase if only domestic demands are met. These results further illustrate the challenges for planning under drought uncertainty and the constraints and cascading effects that the drought could have on the Ethiopian grid. While this concludes the results of our initial experiments, we are left with exciting and hopeful results that can help shape future grid planning and investments in Ethiopia. In summary, we observe that the least cost pathway depends on a diversification of Ethiopia's energy portfolio, drawing on multiple renewable energy sources with that emphasis on wind and solar. An increase in wind and solar also leads to a more resilient grid under climate uncertainty and that threat of increasing drought. We observe that the challenges of meeting and maintaining ambitious export plans under that climate uncertainty. Meeting export goals under the threat of drought will require a rapid build out of many power plants, potentially more than it is currently feasible to finance. Meeting export goals under the threat of drought will also result in an increase in carbon emissions unless energy storage technologies or policies to shift demand are incorporated. However, this collaboration has only just begun and these initial results will inform many future experiments. We are enthusiastic to continue our partnership with the Ethiopia Electric Power Team as we refine the Switch Ethiopia model. We are hopeful for their future anal analysis as we incorporate the electrification of other sectors such as cooking and transportation into our model. Thank you for your time this evening and I will now hand the podium over to Abe to discuss his work on Ethiopian climate policies.
I hope you are not tired. I just have a few policy perspectives. Thanks so much, Deborah and, and, and Emily, for the nice presentations. So based on this, I'm just see a few issues. What are uh, the policy perspectives? What we learn from here and how we're going to proceed in the future? To do that, let us see the African energy portfolio first. When you see the African energy portfolio, 77% of the African energy comes from thermals, from fossil fuel related. And then only the, high, the renewable share of the energy in Africa is very limited. You see the hydro is taking 17% and the geothermal is 5-5%, which is mainly come from Kenya. And solar is 2%. Why Africa is not investing on solar? Why wind is not attractive in Africa? I think we'll see that in the policy perspective. Before that, let us see how hydro looks. When we see hydro, the trend in hydro is we just selected a few countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, how the trends in hydro looks like. You see, we see there is when there's a drought, the hydro fluctuates. So according to the IPCC report, the future Africa would be more severe drought, prolonged drought. And then in the past, if we see this fluctuation, in the, future, in the future, we might see more fluctuations. So what we should do, if you want to move from fossil, if you will move to clean energy, if the hydro is going to be very fluctuation, it's not reliable, what we should do? I think let us see the global trends. The, we see the global trend, two perspectives here. One, by investment. Second, by technology choices. When we see by investment, the global trend is moving from bilateral into private investment. There's a huge private investment coming in a long way. Even at this scope, the trend is moving from bilateral investment into private investment to take the lead. What about the technology choices? The technology choice we see is taking solar is the biggest, attracting investment, wind the second, and hydro is the least. But we see in Africa, hydro is the main investment now. But the global trend is taking solar and wind, taking the global money. Then hydro is taking least investment. By whom? By private. Then African policy needs to align to the global trends. If you want to attract investment, our policy should be aligned with the global trends by technology choices to solar and wind to attract private investment because the private investment is taking the lead than the bilateral investments. I think for this, what we should do, okay, let us come to Ethiopia, come again. Will Ethiopia situation attract solar and wind? Well, why don't we see the energy demand by sectors? When we see the Ethiopian energy demand by sectors, we see more commercial, the highest taking, export, and industry, which is attractive for private investments, which is attractive for solar and wind investors. So the situation on the ground is attracting the global trends, both by technology choices and by investment choices. So what we need is the policy. So what the policy needs to do, before that, let us see the important is acceleration and diversification. For that, let us see the policy perspectives. The policy perspective in general is follows this diagram. But the African, the policy, the policy scenario is kind of starting policy ideation from the political inverse going to policy design, which is combined by the political inverse and the bureaucratic inverse, and the policy adoption by political inverse and also by bureaucratic inverse, and finally the implementation. This is the traditional, the traditional way of the policy making process. But what do we need? The missing is there is no revisions. There is no updates. There is no policy evaluation that goes into the policy ideation, the policy design, and the implementation process. 
and then the policy would be an old policy stuck there without revision, without updates. And the global trend is going somewhere, the policy is stuck somewhere. That we see the global trend is going from private, from bilateral into private, by energy, by technology choice from hydro into solar and wind. Let us see the Kenyan policy. It has been 2005, they have never been revised. What about the Ethiopia? Since 2009-94, it has never been revised. Then the policy is behind, although there is a political support, the policy on the ground is behind the global and regional trends and the climate trends. I think this is a missing link. If you have this missing link corrected, the policy could have been updated, could have been revised, could have been reflecting the current situations, but not. So for this reason, we just, I just summarized the challenges could be into three, openness, attractiveness, and readiness. If you have these three, by what I mean by openness? Just openness means kind of more the policy framework should be aligned with the global and regional trends, and there should be a strong regulatory body. If we don't have a strong regulatory body, that oversees the executive and the implementation, and we're gonna have a yes guys who can't do nothing. The second is we should also attractive. How we can attractive? We should have attractive for bilaterals because we see for privates. Because we see the trend is from bilateral into private. Private want to have a policy framework. What kind of policy framework? Independent regulatory body. Market incentives. And if you don't have that one, the private will not come there. They are there to make money. If we want to make sure it's a win-win situation, we, have, we should have a policy that attracts private, that also helps Africa achieve its goals. If we don't do that, if we ask them to come, whatever we make a nice statement, they will not show up because the thing is not done at home. The last one, we have to also see readiness. The readiness is we have to have a legal institution in place, a contract in place. If we do have, then we show openness, we show readiness, we show attractiveness. Otherwise, if we don't do that, what is gonna happen? Like a Sisyphus trap. We are pushing a failing policy again and again, watching it fail again. If we don't have updates, if we don't revise our policy, what we do is we are in the Sisyphus trap. Sisyphus has been condemned to push this rock, and when it gets at the mountain tip, it falls back. What we do is we push the policy that fails again and again with nothing result. I think this is also happening at the scope. We push things which doesn't give us any result. I think this is, I just want to say, uh, what we should do in Africa in general. And this is a situation is particularly in Kenya and Ethiopia. So we, want, we are planning to, to expand this with our help, NEPAD and UNCA. I think, uh, thanks so much for listening and then thank you so much for the presentation made by my previous uh, colleagues. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, uh, Abai, for, for your great presentation. And thank you for, oh, uh, I was looking for Sisyphus, Sisyphus Shab, yeah? <laughs> That's very important because you say, you know, you, you make the effort, you reach there, but you're never getting there because it keeps coming back on you. We need somebody on the other side to be able to hold. So as you're pushing and somebody is pulling you, and I think that's very important. But I want to thank you all for the wonderful presentations we've made, starting with you, uh, Deborah. You made a wonderful presentation of the switch model and how it has been applied to different countries. Uh, and and it, it, it's, I like the, 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 the triangle, technology, policy, price. Yeah, that is wonderful. And you also emphasize the importance of, uh, of, the, of the fact that the switch is open source. So it is free. And I think it will be good, um, again, uh, later on, if you can project the, 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 the link, 
uh, that shows where people can download the model and how they can make use of it because the beauty about open source is that it's open. You can interrogate it, anybody can adapt it to suit their own needs, and it is open for verification. And I think uh, uh, in this type of modeling where you, you have communities building up their own model, it is important to have open source. So I'm really glad that you have that uh, uh, technology and, and you've shown how you can be able to build capacity going forward, looking at the different technologies when they become most cost effective, and, and also, of course, informed by, by policy. There could be a policy decision that we want this technology now and not later and so on, and the model gives you the opportunity to build through. And then we went through to Emily's uh, presentation to now show the case for Ethiopia, and, uh, and we've done it now in Africa, Ethiopia, and, and Kenya. Is that right, or only Ethiopia? Only Ethiopia. So for my Ethiopian uh, uh, colleagues here, they always say the land of origins. So Ethiopia is the land of origins for the switch model because they're the first one to do the switch model. But uh, I think, uh, as Abai was saying, we're working with AUDA, NEPAD, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa to do this modeling for a few more countries, especially in the context of how do we inform the energy uh, transition. And then, of course, coming to uh, Abai, uh, a presentation about the policy and why uh, being able to analyze the policies and identify the policy gaps is extremely important to go back to that initial triangle that Deborah presented. So ladies and gentlemen, you've heard the presentation. So now it's time for any questions that you would like to ask. And if you want to ask, just indicate, um, introduce yourself, who you are, and is it a general question, a comment, or a specific question? Okay. <coughs> Thank you so much, uh, presenters. This is uh, Dr. Sisa Isinamo from Ministry of Affairs, Ethiopia. Uh, when I look at the, the domestic as well as also the export, uh, you know, modeling, especially in the eastern part, in the northeast and southeastern part of Ethiopia, you have indicated more source from uh, wind than solar farming. And also, even in the climate uncertainty situation, still the wind situation is higher than the, the solar uh, sources. But my just thinking, I'm not uh, an engineer or I'm health background, my thinking is that part of the country is uh, more drier and has more you know, sun opportunities. How does this modeling only focus only on the, so on the wind than the solar source for that part of the, the country. Thank you. Especially for the Eastern. Thank you, Dr. Sisi, for your question. Maybe we'll take a few more questions before we come to you for, for, for the answers. Any other question? Hmm? Oh, OK. And do we know what he's saying? OK. There's also a, qu a comment from online, so Kwame will uh, try to get the answer. But I, I think, um, Emily, when you show the, um, the scenarios going forward, you indicated that gas will come mainly in the Tigray area for generation. Now, is that because of resource availability or just because it's cost effectiveness? Because I would have thought that the gas is in the south, so you have to then ship it all the way to generate there, or you know, what is the motivation of bringing gas on in the Tigray area, unless you're talking about a, a local resource area. And then there's, mm? Mm? Okay. And there's also a question on, online, so if we can get from uh, Andualem. Ah, yeah, from Andualem. Andualem, please go ahead. Can you hear us, Andualem? Andualem, you are muted. We cannot hear you. Rabbi, ask them. Andualem, can you hear us? Anyway, so maybe while we're waiting for Andualem to come on, let's uh, start with the, uh, or you want to answer from? Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for your, for your questions. Um, so I w I'll start with the first question that was asking about um, uh, solar and wind. And so currently the model is taking into account both solar and wind. Um, and we have something like roughly about 500 potential solar and wind plants throughout the entire country um, kind of dispersed throughout and we take into account the 
the time profiles of the solar availability and the wind availability as well. And those are based on uh, data from NOAA uh, on weather patterns, like historical weather patterns. And so all 500 of these potential power plants are being considered, and the results are showing which ones are selected. And so it's based on uh, cost minimization right now, which ones are chosen to be deployed and where. Um, and then the next question that we got was related to the natural gas deployment. So uh, I do want to emphasize that the, with the natural gas deployment, it's not, these are just preliminary results. These are a potential profile of an energy landscape going forward based on least cost. That doesn't mean that it's the only pathway forward. Of course it's not. And the pathway that we did, these are preliminary results. This project just started in July. So storage wasn't yet integrated into the model. And storage would be an alternative to having gas peaker plants. And the reason that the gas is getting deployed in the south is largely because of the export demands going southern. Um, and so that's something to take into account when you are building out these transmission lines. Where's the energy going? So even though you might not have a lot of demand in the south domestically, there was quite a bit of demand um, to the southern countries. And uh, you also indicated, uh, Emily, that um, hydro is coming down, right, with the export scenario, that uh, Ethiopia's uh, share of hydro will be going down. And is there any reason why, why the, the share of hydro will be going down? Uh, is it because of the drought uh, 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 expectations, or is it for other reasons? And if so, because there are still a lot of investments happening in hydro in Ethiopia. And so if you have foreseen already the share of hydro going down, then what happened to about the, the return on those, uh, on those investments? And then you also, in your mod uh, model, also indicated that the cost of the electricity is going up all the time with the export uh, scenario or with the export model. I'm just wondering why, why should the cost be going up when we know that in the long term the cost of technology will be coming down or the resource uh, uh, supply will be... Why is it that the cost is only going up all the time? Is it about the same rate as inflation, or is it uh, beyond inflation that the cost is going up? So maybe any of you can. Uh. Okay, one, two. <laughs> okay, so just because the share of hydro is going down doesn't mean that the installed capacity of, solar, uh, of hydro is going down. So it's just the relative percentage goes down. And that's just an artifact that so much solar and wind is being built out in the export scenario. Um, and the next question was related to the rising price of electricity. And so those were under different drought scenarios. And the drought was assumed to have increasing severity in upcoming, in upcoming years. Um, and so as there's a, a more extreme drought, then you're, the low cost hydro is no longer available and you're forced to put on higher, more expensive power, and that's why you see the increase in electricity. So all of that increased electricity was all under drought scenarios, and then the different lines were different export scenarios, depending on how um, ambitious the exports were outside the country. Oh, and I'll be last. I just, I just, if, I, if I just add what, what Deborah has said, um, Ethiopia only used less than 5% of hydro potential. So that means Ethiopia will continue investment on hydro, but just to share, since Ethiopia will not, don't have any solar or geothermal or wind at this time, when the solar and the wind increases, may, it shows just relatively reduction. But otherwise, does it mean that Ethiopia also should, should, should stop hydro and then only invest on solar and wind, but just based on the cost, and then we might, Ethiopia might also and the technology choice we see in the global trend, Ethiopia might increase. When Ethiopia increases that, the share would, that would be kind of constant. It would be higher than she maybe a reduction in, in total terms. Otherwise. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Abai, for that addition. Um, thank you very much for the three presentations. I think they were very enlightening and um, I just wanted to find out uh, the switch model. 
does it take into consideration the off-grid systems? Uh, in that, especially in a lot of rural communities on the continent, um, there, is, there has been a push to have a system that are off-grid. So then they do not, and there's also no mechanism to even transport the excess of it back onto the national grid. So I just to check, um, was that factored into the planning? Because um, overall, that also becomes part of the installed capacity uh, within a country. So I just wanted to check if that is factored into uh, the model as well. One more, one more question. Thank you, Dr. Linus. So I really only caught the tail end of uh, Ezra's presentation, but I would still like to thank uh, all of the presenters for your presentation. Now, I would like to ask a political economy question, Ezra, uh, and I want to understand the extent to which your models are actually incorporating political economy issues. You were talking about, for instance, creating a policy and legislative environment which would attract private investment in renewables on the continent. But the current trend on the continent is in fact that uh, the, the, the highest private investment is going into fossil investments, into fossil extractions. And this is for a variety of short-term but also long-term political uh, and economic uh, reasons as well. That's the first uh, question. The second is, of course, I mean, there is a lot of concern about the possibility of uh, these investments getting stranded uh, in, the short, in the short run. And this is resulting in policies and legislation outside of the continent, which actually condition the nature of investments which come into the continent. My point being, regardless of what we do on the continent, investments in the continent are currently determined by factors that are external to the... So to what extent is your modeling taking these kinds of dynamics into consideration? Great. Thank you very much, Dr. James. And there's one more question from my brother Aya, and then I'll come back to you, the panelist. I just wanted to know, based on the presentation, that solar and wind is the future. Okay, and but yet Africa country continue to invest in hydropower. So what is the consideration? Is it that the technology and investment in wind and solar is expensive such that Africa countries do, do not see it as a venture as an area to venture? Or what is the motivation behind investment in hydro other than wind? and solar we seem to be the future. Thank you, uh, thank you, Aya. So we have three questions there. I start with the last one. Aya is asking about why do you think that investments are not just focusing on wind and solar, uh, and why are people investing in, in, in hydro? And then uh, Dr. James's question about how do your modeling take into consideration uh, a political economy factors given that investment uh, drivers are not made on the continent, no matter what the continent wants, but from outside, and therefore, there is a mismatch between uh, what the modeling could be doing based on the policy and what investments would uh, actually be, uh, be doing. And then, and finally, to the first question by Kwame, uh, is the switch model also including off-grid uh, options? So I don't know who would like to start first. Deborah, you start? That's a lot of great questions, so I hope I'm able to remember them all so I can answer them all. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to do them in the order that they came. So first, in terms of dealing with the switch model, it's very scalable. So it can be used, most generally it's used for large centralized grids, but I'm working on a project in French Polynesia, and we're doing that as a series of microgrids. So it's completely scalable, so you can do it, you can use it for microgrids, um, uh, but there's also, um, I don't know, simpler, smaller models like Homer and things like that that can be also processed for microgrids. Um, but Switch has this complete versatility and the scale that you can use it for. All right, and then the second question was about foreign investment. I will have Abe answer most of this question. But the Switch model, the way that you can look into that is when you're modeling what the investment is in different 
energy generation technologies, you need to come up with what the overnight price is. And in, in baked into that overnight price, you could put in different finance mechanisms and how, eas how viable it is to get finance for those technologies in, your s in a given country. And those could have drivers that are external. Um, so for example, like in solar and wind, you can look at exponential decay in the cost of solar panels. And so you can take into account that driver of technology innovation and bake that into the overnight cost associated with deploying a new solar wind technology. Okay. And then the last question was about why hydro, uh, especially when all these model results are basically suggesting to not invest so much in hydro and it's really, really important to diversify your grid, especially to be resilient against climate uncertainty. Um, and I think, so historically why those choices were made, I'm sure that there's a lot of great reasons for it, of availability and availability of financing for these large projects. Um, and large hydro is a, a style of investment that's quite common and to be used for funders from like the World Bank and things like that. So there's, there's reasons that could be driving why hydro has been historically invested in. Um, however, solar and wind are quite affordable and the, the, the switch model is deciding where to invest based on the cost of those technologies. And so as we can see, there's a lot more deployment in the future in, of solar and wind technologies and it's because they are cheaper than investing in more hydropower. And it's also with hydropower, the most affordable hydropower plants, uh, the locations that had the best reservoir resource and things like that have already been deployed or are predetermined to be built over the next couple of years. And so after you build out your least cost hydropower plants, now the future hydro plants can be much more expensive. And so that could be another reason why they become less attractive and hydro is very unattractive in drought situations. So that's why there's uh, much less deployment of hydro under drought. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, Deborah. I think Deborah has explained most of the, the, the questions and then good to see you, uh, Aya, by the way. Uh, I think there is incumbent, hydro is incumbent. There is an incumbent advantage. Because if you see the hydro, there is so much school, there is so much technical know-how on hydros. Africa has that, has been there, and we have the skills, we have the know-how how to do it. Since we know how to do it, it's easier for us to do it, again and again. So if you see solar and wind, one of the gap is technical know-how. We don't have the technical know-how, even we don't have the maintenance know-how. Even we don't have the installing know-how. One company there is in South Africa, which is Saratek, at, at utility scale level. We don't have any even company that works on solar, and we don't have any research and development in Africa. The curriculum in Africa is not geared towards solar and wind technology. If it is geared, it is at initial stage. We don't have a renowned or a well-known area in Africa in terms of solar and wind. So this is a technical gap is there. The no hub is gap is there. That also kind of preventing African from you know, fostering or aggressively moving toward the solar and wind technology. I think that is one reason, one reason we are, Africa is not moving that much as we expected to go. I think uh, James, um, you know, it's just very, it's very, you know, it's very critical this. But mod, you know, model is, as, as Deborah is saying, it's, it's just it's a capturing of reality. It's like, I see model as a tailor. If you, have, if you go to a tailor, you ask them how to do it for you, how to fit it to you. So any model, you can tailor it to your needs and demands and priorities. That means you can put constraints, you can put another parameters. I think. We are planning to do with you and an, an, an EPAR and this expanding to Africa to see how it would be show the investment option. And we can develop it in our size that fits our interests and needs. Because we can add constraints, we can add parameters. I think that way we can, we, can, we can make it work for us, for our interests. I think once he, if Africa don't come together, 
we will be remain fragile, weak, and divided, and poor, and without electric access for the next decades. If we come together, use this opportunity, Africa, we lost the biotechnology revolutions, the green revolutions, because we are fighting on regulations, we are fighting on here and that, and Africa lost the green revolutions, why East Asia has been, you know, undermine the poverty, have been successful in green revolutions. If we fight the same on wind and solar, we'll remain behind. The future is solar and wind. If we don't jump in the bandwagon, in the bandwagon, and then we'll be remain behind. We miss the first revolution, the solar revolution. We miss the green revolution. I think this is our opportunity to, to use it. We have the resource, we have the wind, we have the potential, extremely potential. And if we have the political power translated into action, I think this wind requires a regional approach. For example, in Kenya, they have the IPP, they are generating more than they can consume. The IPP is producing more than they consume. If there was regional integration, there would be a market. Because of lack of regional integration, because the grid is not connected, the China government is in crisis because they are paying much for IPP, which the people don't consume. I think we see a good example in Kenya how the grid connection is very vital for Africa's markets. And for the West as well, I think for, to export to Europe or others, I think that is very crucial, that's very important, that's how I see it, the political economy. Just we have to reverse the table. I think one of, for me, if I say, this negotiation COP27 is not moving forward as we expected is because Africa has started engaging. It's not a passive recipient. If we engage, then it would be slow. But it would be for a good for all of us. For the planet, it would be good because we are engaging. I think if we engage in that way, even if we slow, I think it would be good for us, for the planet, not for Africa. We live in the same planet. And if we see from a different perspective, I think we'll have the best solution. That's, that's how I see it for, for the political economy jumps. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Abai. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah and Emily. Um, you're quite right. Again, I go back to the triangle. Policy, technology, finance. And the policy is very critical. And as you say, the model is a linear optimization which is based on constraints. So you can constrain it on anything you like. You can constrain it to say, I want to do this amount of hydro, or this amount of solar, or this amount of wind. Then it will tell you that based on that constraint, this is the cheapest option for you. It can also tell you about where you should put the capacity, where you should put the transmission, and so on. But that modeling alone is not enough because there are other issues, like James said, there is a political economy. The investment, which is the finance bit of it, is more complex than what the model can do. And it is important that the policymaker really understands how that all fits in. So I want to thank you all very much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, 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 Deborah, for uh, presenting us the switch and showing us what it is. It is a free one. I was hoping that they would have put the link, but no problem. Um, yeah, we passed it. Yeah, there you are. So that's the link, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a free software. You can. You can download it, and uh, thank you, uh, Emily, for giving us the uh, Ethiopian case, and thank you, Abai, for giving us this policy that I mentioned, but at the end of the day, and also, unfortunately, Andualem was connected, but he became, um, because of the techni technical uh, difficulty we're having, he was uh, disconnected. But I want to thank you all, and can we please uh, join our hands together to thank them for a the wonderful presentation. And we look forward to our continuing collaboration with uh, the Climate Policy Lab at um, the Fletcher School at Tufts University, together with AUDA, NEPAD, and uh, ECA, and African Union Commission. We were going to see how we can do more of these country studies to begin to stitch uh, together what the energy landscape going to the future could be. Thank you all very much.
come and join. Aya is a Aya, Aya. Aya. Ha, ha, ha.